Andres, I am so uh, happy to have you here. And we are very fortunate to have you here with the uh, ClinGen Ancestry and Diversity Forum today. I can't believe it's August already. Um, very exciting. Uh, so the title of um, our talk that we're going to be hearing from today is Indigeneity Within Datasets, DNA Sequences, Journeys, and Genomic Representations about the Karitiana people. And you can probably help me pronounce what the actual name is. Isha. 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 Fantastic. Um, so I actually um, met um, Dr. Baragan at uh, UC Davis in the Science, Technology, and Society uh, sort of monthly book club that we were doing for, for a while there. And um, it's been really wonderful getting to know him. We're very fortunate to have his expertise um, from the Department of Science, Technology, Society, uh, Science, Technology Studies program at UC Davis. Um, his interests are in ethnographic, historical, and conceptual aspects in the production, dissemination, and consumption of scientific knowledge. So um, I'm sure his uh, his book will be really exciting to read and, and fascinating, and I don't want to take up any more of his time to present. Uh, so um, if you have questions um, for Dr. Baragan during the talk, please enter them into the chat and I'll take them into consideration. And um, at the end, hopefully we'll have about 10, 15 minutes for discussion. Um, and then uh, we, will, um, we will hopefully um, also have time at the end just for um, final concluding thoughts. So take it away and um, let me know if you are unable to share your screen. Thank you. All right, can you see my slides? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, okay, uh, Jim is very sorry. He cannot be here with us today. Uh, but he truly hopes that um, you guys find this uh, work in progress useful and we're looking forward to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, so today uh, we're sharing preliminary findings and reflections about how digital human genomic sequences are being resituated and reused by life scientists around the world and the challenges uh, of such practices for tissue donors and their relatives. Uh, or archival, conceptual, and ethnographic work centers around the circulation of DNA data sets from the Caritina people, uh, an indigenous group that today inhabits the margins of the Zapote River in Portovelo municipality, uh, located in the state of Rondonia in the Brazilian Amazon. We are particularly interested in the way cultural and biological representations of their community allow and entice the traveling and the resituation of data sets among uh, genomic research laboratories and how such representations are contested and or reinforced during such processes. Uh, we care about the material and semiotic dimensions of how blood samples lymphoblastoid cell lines and digital DNA sequences stand as unequivocal representations of the Caritiana through time and space. This case study is part of a larger research project funded by the US National Science Foundation. One of its main objectives is to track and understand how the production and traveling understood as reuse of a specific scientific objects in human genomics, like uh, models, data sets, software, findings, diagrams, individually or in bundles, is engaged by other life scientists and the individuals and communities they study. And between these and other stakeholders concerned with issues of data governance, innovation, identity, metadata, and scientific robustness. Uh, we have distributed our preliminary arguments and findings into the following four sections. Uh, what it's in a population name, the biomateriality of a human population, uh, DNA journeys, traveling representations, and uh, towards informed co-participation. So what it's in a population name? Despite calling themselves Yisha, 
The community is nationally and globally known as Caritiana, a name most likely assigned by Rupert Tappers in the second half of the 19th century, but that today articulates much of their indigeneity, that is, a way of being indigenous in the 21st century. Uh, the Caritiana, along with other indigenous communities in the Amazon basin, have notoriously captured the scientific imagination of Brazilian and international explorers, anthropologists, linguists, and life scientists since the late 19th century. A shared assumption across a variety of disciplinary interests is that as a relatively small community, the Caritiana have managed to remain culturally and biologically isolated from other larger segments of the Brazilian population. This is a characterization taking place both to time across the Spanish and Portuguese conquest uh, independent empire and republic periods, and to space within the Amazonian rainforest. In this context, uh, the Caritiana have embodied Western ideas such as exotic, guardians of nature, inbred, primitive, pure, obstacles to economic development, savage, among others, uh, as they became uh, subjects of state governance and research subjects for science. From the point of view of the Caritiana, such embodiments have had as common denominator an ongoing social, cultural, and biological struggle to thrive as a society within their territory. In 2014, the Brazilian Information System for Indigenous Health uh, stated that the Caritiana population size to be 333 people, uh, with the great majority living in the main village, Kiowa and others spread out in the nearby towns and cities accessible by uh, dirt roads uh, that connect with uh, municip the municipal paved highways. Uh, Caritiana subsistence is still dependent on fishing and hunting and more recently on mid-scale agriculture. Uh, the size of the territory allows them to produce surplus yield, fruits, coffee, maize, that is being sold for money or exchange for processed food and or manufactured goods. A similar process takes place with uh, Caritiana handcrafts. In recent years, uh, the Caritiana have strengthened their cultural and political visibility through multiple global outlets like Twitter and YouTube. These economic and social cultural exchanges with non Caritianas today cannot be understood as a threat to their identity or their authenticity. If anything, such exchanges are part of the essence of being indigenous in a self proclaimed multicultural nation state as Brazil. And for the purpose of our analysis, these current ethnographic vignettes. Uh, are useful to help us recalibrate the relative idea of isolation that usually tags indigenous groups living in the Amazon basin. Uh, this search for social political autonomy has encouraged the Caritiana also to denounce the commodification of tissue and genomic data from members of the community as life scientists attempted to document and interpret human gen genetic diversity. Uh, the listing of lymphoblastoid uh, cell lines from Caritiana individuals for sale by Coriel Institute for uh, Medical Research was first addressed in Brazil by anthropologist Ricardo Ventura Santos and Carlos Coimbra in 1996, right after the two researchers participated in the annual meeting of the American Association of Physical Anthropology in Research Jungle Park in North Carolina. At that conference, representatives of Coriel were advertising their human diversity collection, which included cell lines from the Caritiana and Surui people in Brazil, the Waroani in Ecuador, and the Quechua from Peru, all as representatives of South American Indians. Santos and Coimbra's criticisms, criticisms uh, set in motion both political and legal maneuvers in Brazil to establish the provenance of the tissue and outline possible actions to stop the commodification of the cell lines. The Caritiana case was added to a long global list of potential commodification of genetic materials from indigenous groups collected by several uh, non-governmental organizations such, action, such as Action Group on Erosion, Technology and Concentration, ETC, working both in Canada and the US. 
Uh, 11 years later, in June 2007, the case reached a larger audience when the New York Times published an expose by journalist Larry Rother after he visited the community a few weeks before. His article was structured in the form of a scandal and managed to silence some of the findings already produced by Brazilian authorities after Santos and Coimbra's article in 1996, in particular, and those produced after by researchers of the National Indigenous Foundation uh, and by some of the researchers allegedly involved in the collection of tissue. Nonetheless, uh, Rutter's report uh, brought further information about some of the uh, US life scientists and the research networks that made possible the immortalization of blood samples into cell lines. Section two, uh, the biomateriality of a human population. How did Coriel Institute end up reproducing and distributing cell lines from members of the Caritiana people in the mid 1990s? This was the result of serendipity, the networking efforts of life scientists, and the consolidation of global research as agendas, uh, framing indigenous people as key research subjects for understanding various aspects of human evolutionary adaptability. A key figure in this story was Canadian epidemiologist Francis L. Black. Uh, he did his PhD at UC Berkeley in biochemistry and joined the faculty at the Yale University School of Medicine in 1955. In the 1960s, uh, Black expanded his contributions from the study of vaccines to a more comprehensive agenda that included the epidemiology of isolated populations. Black made the Brazilian Amazon his main fieldwork area, producing epidemiological studies in close collaboration with Brazilian colleagues among more than 20 indigenous groups. Other life scientists such as James V. Neal started developing parallel research agendas during the 1960s under global programs supported by organizations such as uh, UNESCO and the World Health Organization. Uh, perhaps one of the most significant agendas for the Amazon Basin was carried out by the Human Adaptability Committee within the International Biological Program, uh, co-directed by Neil between 1964 and 1974. The uh, human adaptability component was responsible for the study of non-complex societies living in harsh natural environments. A structural emphasis was the correlations between phenotypical manifestations and ecological settings. The program provided fieldwork experience for several researchers that in the next decade became prominent figures in human population genetics around the globe while focusing instead on genotypes. Uh, in 1973, uh, geneticist Kenneth Kidd and anthropologist Judy Kidd became faculty at the School of Medicine at Yale University. Uh, the work done by Black was an inspiration for the kids to start working with uh, human populations and a long-term collaboration among the three started. Uh, the first documented collection of blood samples among the Caritiana by Black and his wife, Joyce Black, took place at the end of the 1980s. The tissue collected from 77 individuals made possible their first co-author article in the journal uh, Human Biology in 1991. Uh, but that time, the kids had mastered the technique for the immortalization of blood samples. Uh, in the method sections of this article, uh, the authors stated, quotes, uh, for all the three populations, uh, meaning Mayas from the state of Campeche, Mexico, and from the Caritian and Surui in Brazil, uh, blood was drawn in the field and transported to the lab at jail where B lymphocytes were isolated and transformed with Epstein-Barr virus following essentially the protocol of Anderson and Gusella. Uh, we established cell lines from each of these populations on 40 to 54 individuals. For each population, five cell lines from unrelated individuals had been deposited uh, in the NIGMS, Human Genetic Mutant Cell Repository at the Coriel Institute for Medical Research, end of quote. Uh, the kids not only share some cells 
cell lines, we'd call it a Correll Institute, but also contributed to some of uh, to the Human Genome Diversity Project at the time under the leading figure of Luigi Cavalli Sforza at Stanford University. Uh, the inclusion of the Caritana cell lines as part of the Human Genome Diversity Project, Diversity Project Diversity Panel around 1991 paved uh, the way for the current online distribution of their members' DNA in the form of digital data sets. Uh, the censure of the sale of the Caritiana cell lines by leaders of the community and multiple activists overlap and echoed the strong criticisms against the Human Gen Genome Diversity Project and the future of tissue collection representing global human diversity. At the end of the administrative life of the Human Genome Diversity Project, uh, its leaders approved uh, transferring the diversity panel to the Human Polymorphism Study Center uh, of the Jean Doucet Foundation in Paris, France. Uh, this strategy sought to address both criticisms produced and allow to future researchers access to uh, 1,063 cell lines gathered by its collaborators and representing 52 populations. Today, uh, the center stores 21 male and 27 female Caritiana cell lines, 48 in total, and carries out online creation of the data sets produced by over 113 investigators since 2002. Uh, today, uh, Coriel Institute no longer lists information about the Caritiana cell lines or the data sets they have produced. Uh, similarly, uh, the Allele Frequency Database, or ALFRED, uh, produced and curated by the kids at Yale University, has taken a similar strategy, uh, dropping the listing of Caritiana cell lines. These actions can be interpreted as an institutional concession to the political pressure set in motion by Caritiana individuals and advocates both in the US and Brazil, uh, although Neither Coriel or the kids have explicitly and acknowledged such reasoning. Yet these actions speak more generally about the urgency of tracking how current uses of digital data sets might be in tension with the original informed consent processes that granted the collection of tissue samples like those from the Caritiana. So section three, DNA journeys, uh, traveling representations. Uh, so this is a timeline for the case study. We can go back to it uh, in our Q&A. Uh, in order to better understand the epistemic and technical scaffolding that granted blood, cell lines, and digital data sets material and semiotic power to represent the Caritiana, we have started tracking and mapping every single human population genetics and biomedical study that has used blood samples, cell lines, and digital DNA data sets about the community since the 1980s. Uh, today, we are sharing some of the trends we are identifying based on an analysis of a subset of 24 studies from a total of 66 identified so far. Uh, the most general and obvious argument is that the availability of cell lines and digital DNA uh, sequences is responsible for the increasing inclusion and the representation of the Caritiana in biomedical literature to the point of earning them an almost ubiquitous presence when talking about human uh, genetic diversity and structure. However, there's a catch, a trade-off, uh, or even a paradox. The higher the number of studies, including data sets about the Caritiana, the less specific the knowledge produced is about them. In other words, the number of findings about the community has been decreasing as the resituation of the digital DNA data sets from their blood samples increases among biomedical researchers. In the last eight years, the Caritiana subset in the Human Genome Diversity, uh, CEPH Diversity Panel, has been extensively reused. 
Uh, nonetheless, a good number of these studies do not have as a goal studying the caritiana per se, but rather using them as a digital uh, DNA population control to answer specific questions about other populations, uh, specific biomedical problems, and or, or larger human evolutionary questions about the peopling of the world. This type of resituation of the Caritiana data sets makes it easier for good old uh, cultural assumptions to travel along to the point of misrepresentation. For example, in some cases, the Caritiana can represent the Caritiana, indigenous people from Amazonia, indigenous people from Brazil, indigenous people from South America, indigenous people from the Americas, indigenous peoples from Latin America, or even the Latino population, whatever that means these days in the context of the US. Needless to say, these generalizations have serious consequences for the validity uh, of biomedical claims or clinical trials. Uh, such representation contrasts those uh, framing the Caritiana as an isolated group, both culturally and genetically. However, uh, the assumed lack of admixture between the Caritiana and other people can end up reproducing the characterization of the group as inbred. Uh, despite their history of forced migration within the Amazonian territory and despite the kinship alliances with members of other smaller indigenous communities. Some of such alliances and mixtures with other groups have been documented ethnographically, but most importantly, they're still present in the oral traditions of the community as they narrate their struggle to avoid extinction. The contradictory but complementary genomic representations set in motion by life scientists in the since the 1960s have both traveled along the material semiotic transition between blood samples, cell lines, and digital DNA data sets. Uh, a final trend we are identifying is that for those more recent studies that reflect with more detail about issues of representation about the Caritiana, the main goal was evaluating the robustness of the human genome diversity uh, as a data set, uh, panel, sorry, panel as a data set, as a model for comparison while tracking human diversity. These types of data curation, although valuable, uh, matter to us, uh, are valuable and matter to us because it constitutes methodological implosions that fragment data sets in data points, into data points. And in doing so, life scientists enable and close possible routes for representation to travel along with uh, genomic data sets. This case study is offering so far key insights on how genomic data sets can embed cultural representations about indigeneity that set the very value and pace for the resituation in biomedicine, human population genetics, and human evolutionary studies. Likewise, the case is providing evidence of how difficult it is for the very individuals and the community they represent to attempt updating the metadata circumscribing the material and semiotic dimensions standing as a representation of their current indigeneity. Uh, the case also allows us to gesture uh, the anachronic impossibility of blaming past informed consent processes for not catching up with uh, the contemporary fast-paced logics of data-centric biology and how we as scientists, but also as citizens, engage with most of speculating and banking on and sharing human genomic data. It is difficult to imagine that Francis L. Black could have envisioned the transcendence reached by the material semiotic embodiments of the blood samples he collected at the end of the 1980s in the Amazonian rainforest irreparably absent, uh, the impossibility of gathering his thoughts on our findings leaves us with uh, the urgent responsibility of owning the epistemic and ethical conundrum. Um, I'm calling this section toward better resituation of human genomic data sets. Uh, we want to use the archival and conceptual findings emerging from our tracking activities 
as a proof of concept that justifies producing a similar endeavor for each of the other 51 populations represented in the human genome diversity uh, project diversity cell lamp panel. We, we believe that having this type of thick description and analysis available online as a companion for each uh, data set will offer researchers an opportunity to thoroughly think about the epistemological and ethical ramifications of reusing digital data sets in new research workflows. Uh, that by itself can improve the overall structure for producing findings and disseminating them. Uh, we have started, started producing similar efforts for uh, population subsets in other nearby countries such as Colombia, and it is clear that the availability of archival data will determine the depth of our analysis. Yet any context for each subset is better than nothing, considering that we are talking about sample collection processes that are at least over 30 years old. Uh, as we move forward and finalize our tracking of the totality of the largest possible number of biomedical and human population studies uh, that have included data sets about the Caritiana, we expect to increase the amount of detail for each of these potential modes. Uh, lastly, but uh, most importantly, um, oh, wait, sorry, I, 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 I missed a little bit of uh, data here. Um, okay, so, uh, excuse me, Be beyond our main analysis of how representations about uh, populations travel within human uh, genomic data sets, another potential outcome of our tracking of how life scientists track diversity could be rethinking, updating, and enhancing informed consent processes. Uh, we want to offer you a teaser about what we think as a governance model for the Caritiana data sets cool or might look based on the previous epistemic and semiotic challenges outlined so far. Uh, by informed co-participation, we mean a model for human population genetics and biomedical research that actively integrates tissue donors or their descendants into a, a project's uh, research processes. The goal is to allow donors to reassess the use of genomic data sets, the metadata, what they represent as a population through time and space, and the very findings yielded uh, by the genomic renderings produced. The logic behind such approach of following anthropologist Alcida Rita Ramos is that uh, the Caritiana are not simply research subjects, but agents of their indigeneity. It's important to emphasize that we are not proposing a replacement of current informed consent protocols for human subjects. Our modest model can be best thought about as an add-on step one uh, once uh, IRB approvals have been obtained. Besides considering the logistical strategies that could or will enable that kind of interaction to take place between members of the Caritiana and life scientists around the world, we're also brainstorming about the conceptual specificities that should, uh, that should guide the interactions. For example, a model of informed participation should encompass so far at least two modes, uh, depending on whether the model is used for new projects relying on the collection of new tissue specimens, saliva, blood, etc., or for projects relying on stored cell lines and or on already downloadable digital DNA sequences. Uh, again, as we move forward and finalize our uh, tracking activities, we expect to increase the amount of detail for each of these potential modes. Uh, and lastly, but most importantly, it will be up for the Caritiana communities to decide whether a mature version of our model fits the way they envision autonomy. So uh, this is our field report for now, and uh, now we can open it up uh, for uh, questions and we can go back to some of the slides, et cetera. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that fascinating presentation. And we do have quite a bit of time for discussion, which is amazing. So I'm um, happy to take questions now. And then I have 
a few, uh, and I'd like to tie it into ClinGen probably in the last 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but if folks want to just raise their hand. Oh, Sharon, uh, Sharon Fong. Um, thank you so much for coming and talking. It was just totally fascinating. So I had a couple of sort, somewhat practical questions, if, if you don't mind, especially based off of your last slide. So one of the things that ClinGen does care about is what we call genotype frequencies, right? Um, is a variant common in a population because that might suggest it's not associated with disease. Um, and um, obviously, there's lots of work that researchers do with LCL cell lines, as you talked about. But I guess I was trying to understand with regard to sort of the partnership, the step you were talking about at the end. Um, I know that Alice and some others on this call have worked with Native American populations, and there's sort of a structure to the tribes, and there's a leadership structure, and there's been developed ways to work with that leadership. Um, in order to engage in research in a better way than we've done before. And so I was wondering with this population, is there sort of a specific structure, a leadership structure and sort of an agreed upon structure among the group? Um, if they did want to be engaged in a, in a research project, like how that would play out? Uh, so far, the answer to your question is yes and no. So there, there's perspectives about uh, whether to be open to collaborate with uh, scientists changes from generation to generation. Uh, so there might be individuals in the community that are interested in this, in taking care of, you know, producing better dialogues and are open to work with anthropologists, uh, biological anthropologists, geneticists, etc. And uh, it becomes very personal, and that's one of the challenges that. Um, you know, my impact, how uh, robust or model is. Uh, the idea initially will be to uh, explore how um, some, whether it's possible for some members of the community to, you know, kind of uh, interact with researchers uh, around the world interested in using uh, uh, data sets uh, coming from the community and whether that can, you know, be um, a step towards like uh, producing a more, uh, a different way of um, uh, bringing the community into new projects that require the collection of new tissue. So uh, at this stage, everything is exploratory. We, I, 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 we want to be done with the analysis of all the studies available to start seeing problems and probably start uh, producing some uh, conversations and interviews with members of the community to address these issues and identify um, what are their concerns about the reuse of these uh, data sets and about the implications about how they get represented in the studies. And based on that, then we can kind of like improve what the model that we are aiming for, right? Right, no, that, that's really helpful. I guess part of the reason I brought it up is that um, in my own experience now many years ago, I was studying a rare recessive disorder um, that um, had been termed Navajo poikiloderma, but we actually recommended changing that name. Um, and one of the things we discovered is that there were individuals with that disorder living in cities in Arizona who had consented to our project, although we then became aware that the Navajo Nation as a whole had put a ban on any um, uh, genetic studies at the time. We're, we're going back almost 15 years. And so there's that sort of struggle between individual decisions of people who are a member of the group and the group itself. And that's why I was sort of wondering if there's a structure to the leadership of the group um, with regard to making decisions, but it sounds like you're you're trying to piece that out as, as you approach your work. So appreciate that answer. Oh, thank you. No, this is very useful. Like, so I have extensive ethnographic, experience, you know, uh, uh, research experience with uh, ethnic minorities in Colombia and in the um, Amazonian, uh, the Colombian part of the Amazon. And this is the challenge: is like one model doesn't fit all. 
because uh, in a context like Colombia, where you know indigenous groups in theory have control over 33% of the uh, territory of the country, uh, you will think that their uh, political agendas are quite different. So you have some of the communities, they care about these issues. Um, if they can profit from you know, having researchers doing uh, genetic studies, that's fine. They don't have you know, a problem with um, uh, granting access to tissue. But there are others that do have problems with that. So it becomes like each community is its own universe. And this is me stepping into the Brazilian realm of the Amazon. And it's pretty much the same. Uh, just like uh, the problem is that it's fragmented within the politics of the community. So some generations, some members of the community are more uh, conservative, some others are more open to you know, new initiatives, despite the fact that in the past uh, there have been uh, friction or debate about uh, how uh, uh, samples ended up in different research laboratories, et cetera. So it requires that the next step, once we're done uh, tracking and mapping uh, trends uh, in these uh, research studies, it will be to you know create the conversation to see if actually a model like this makes sense for them. Thank you. And Andres, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this what you're doing is somewhat different from the question of community versus individual consent to participate in research as we have going on in the United States with American Indian and Alaska Native populations, because what you're doing is more an exploration of what the issues might be and what the studies have been that have included these samples to, as a conversation starter where so you're not looking necessarily for a decision point and trying to find the right person to tell you what the decision is on behalf of the community but more so exploring the different perspectives within the community to better figure out what a way forward might look like yeah you're, you're right so the challenge for me so even as an anthropologist when i was starting doing field work back in the mid uh 2000s you might have permission to do research uh from some members of the community and you have informed consent but that doesn't mean that two years down the road another leader in the community will say like well you know what i'm actually not happy with that and i'm gonna say no and then you're stuck. I faced that as an anthropologist and later on when I started doing the research on these exchanges between life scientists and ethnic minorities, I learned that well they face the same problem and it's it's a huge challenge uh, for um, um, researchers and it usually ends up you know in framing life scientists are as taking advantage of communities and that's not the case. Uh, always. Uh, I have worked with MDs and geneticists that uh, have actually better uh, ethical approaches than the ones I had when I was doing ethnographic work, and I have learned from that. So, so far at this stage, what we uh, want is um, have a clear map of how um, the data sets have been used and identify all the issues and start a discussion uh, with that. And hopefully, you know, it, it's a discussion that involves not only members of the Caritiana community and authorities in Brazil, but also about researchers, because we need to uh, overcome technical uh, issues like, you know, does the community have access to internet? Because, well, going to the Caritiana territory is really difficult and it's highly expensive so it's unlikely that these uh, kind of like uh, dialogues will take uh, uh, place in person it needs uh, infrastructure like access to internet so we just need to explore like uh, whether this is actually you know something that can be carried out absolutely thank you for that so uh, i saw jennifer troyer's hand first and then mark feldman yeah, my question follows on a little bit on what you and Sharon were just talking about. But where do you see 
genomic issues as unique in research. I mean, I clearly there's the, you know, that the findings apply to the community, but I would actually imagine in, in other ethnographic things, that is also true. And another place I think it might be unique is sort of how da far downstream the findings are from the starting point. So we're talking 20, 30 years later, there might still be some new work going on and new discoveries being made. And, and if that creates a problem as if, as you're talking about the, the culture changes over time and the people's attitudes about things change over time. But where are the places where it's just another example of research with indigenous people? And where are the places where we have really special considerations that we have to take into account when we're doing genomics? Thank you, Jennifer. Yes, I, I agree. Um, it, human genomics is not the only um, discipline practice that has these issues. I, as an anthropologist, I uh, recognize many of them um, as I was uh, interacting with several groups in the region. Um, I, 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 I'm afraid I, I don't have a, a full answer to that, but I, I, I do promise that I will keep this um, in, in mind as Jim and I work on the manuscript. Our idea is to uh, transform the text that I just read to you into an article that uh, can probably be a proof of concept of, you know, uh, of, you know, First, you, you know, that doing this work for each of the uh, uh, populations represented in the diversity panel is useful for everyone, for life scientists, but also for the communities, because it, it can help reducing uh, all these assumptions that travel along with the, the data set itself. Um, and whether or, you know, modest uh, model survives, well, um, no hard feelings if, if, if it ends up being, you know, like wishful thinking, but at least uh, at the end of it, we will have uh, built um, a, a companion for the data set that probably will be useful. Thanks. Okay, so um, Mark Feldman and then Carlos. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, when we were developing the Human Genome Diversity Project in early 1990, um, our idea was to have a history, an evolutionary history of all of the populations in the world, not just indigenous populations. And our original idea was based on language and the idea that the groups could be to some extent at least identified by their linguistic um, differences. Um, that was not possible because there were no resources for that. And that is why the uh, uh, resource became what had been collected for other purposes. And you showed some of them from the early HLA uh, studies. Um, now, in the Amazon, among the studies that had been done, the Karatiana were not unique. There was another tribe as well that you didn't mention called the Surui. The Surui, yes. yes. So they're also in that panel. So um, it's not that the Karatiana are uh, regarded as special, they're regarded as Amazonian and uh, important because um, that uh, part of the world had uh, had some investigation from uh, Neil's group in Michigan um, for other purposes, both anthropological and genetic, human genetic, uh, well before um, the HLA stuff came out. Um, those uh, studies, I think the kids might have been involved in those studies as well, but uh, there were other scientists. Um, the, that how you go about dealing with indigenous peoples, of any, any indigenous peoples, was addressed in a review article by Hank Greeley uh, in the Houston Law Review, um, especially in connection with those uh, groups that have leaders uh, where 
it is customary to get approval from the leaders. There's no democracy involved here. You don't have to have individual, you have the leader consent. Um, so each of those uh, tribes, particularly in the American, in the, uh, American uh, area, uh, has to be, and, and is acknowledged that it has to be treated differently uh, so that the um, different uh, peculiarities of the culture of each tribe has to be taken into account. Now, how one can go about uh, predicting what would be the 30 year future ramifications of collecting data on something today, um, I don't think that's uh, a feasible uh, 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 way to do science. We have those data. What we can say is that at each point in the study of these populations, the data have been used for different purposes. First, the HI. Uh, let's say, then uh, the uh, microsatellite data that you referred to from Rosenberg et al. Then the DNA polymorphisms, uh, single nucleotide polymorphism from Lee et al. Now you may have to put in, how does that, all of those, how do all of those data fit with something like the ancient DNA, the uh, actual formation of these populations. That, that's the next step. There was a little mention of that in one of your slides. And the future will be, what would these people regard as acceptable statements about their origins uh, relative to the first migrations into the Americas? That's probably the next step that they would have to confront as uh, something cultural for them but the data themselves uh, point to the uh, arrival in the uh, Americas as being a singular event um, that took place after the other spread of pop human population, hominid populations, human populations around the world. Um, I don't think that that's a debatable uh, issue. The question is for the peoples whether they have an origin myth, an origin belief that either contradicts or coincides with, or can reinforce the, what you call the digital data. Um, and if they have a belief that uh, basically contradicts what appears to be forthcoming from the data, that is their culture. And there's, there's nothing that anybody is going to do about that. And that is part of anthropology and it needs to be recognized as part of that tribe's beliefs. It doesn't say anything about uh, factual matters about origins and whether they think that the data should not be made available because it contradicts their origin myths. At that point, you, you have a real problem and what to do with uh, the data, whether it should be uh, closed up if it disagrees with their um, origin myths. I, I think those are the uh, sort of interesting issues, and some of them are addressed in that article by Greeley in the Houston Law Review. Oh, Andres, you're muted. Sorry about that. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that insight. Uh, um, quick, quick thoughts. Um, it, it, it's interesting. Yes, the, the sururi is equally uh, present, but there is a, a trend mark that for some reason, the Caribbean are more visible in how the data set is uh, used, at least in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, the sururi, although their data set is available, has been used less. So why that uh, is the case? I, I don't have a, a clear answer. Maybe it's just like, for some reason, the Caritian started uh, being cited more often in the literature and people uh, went directly to that particular subset. Uh, but you're right, it's, it's not the only um, Amazonian uh, community um, uh, represented in the large um, uh, diversity panel. Um, yet there are also interesting things that I, as I have glimpsed into uh, other potential archives is um, there is a mention of uh, Colombian samples and 
what it's interesting about that is like rather than mentioning a specific groups within the territory of Colombia, they are tagged or the metadata uh, uh, distinguish them as uh, Colombian. So what I'm after with Jim at this stage is like kind of like building context for that. What happened? Was the scientist that was collaborating and sent the, the samples, the, the specific uh, metadata for those samples got lost or um, is it possible to try to uh, reconstruct from which populations within Colombia those samples uh, came from, et cetera. So we have um, a larger kind of like um, context that uh, can help us to, you know, um, approach um, the human genome diversity uh, project panel uh, in a better way. Well, thanks for that. And Andres, I wonder, just thinking back on Jennifer Troyer's question about what makes potentially genetics research special relative to other research in in indigenous populations around the world. Um, you know, I've been thinking about this, you know, Mark's talking about, we have the data, we have the cell lines. If you're doing an ethnography, you're collecting information about a community at a, at a specific point in time. And then in the future, you can refer back to that within a historical context. But if we have cell lines that are alive, we are, we're sort of looking at data today and thinking we're talking about modern populations when really we're talking about you know, when it was collected, even if there have been changes since then. So just wonder if, you know, if you and Jim want to explore that. And we love having works in progress on the Ancestry and Diversity Forum. So if you want to come back uh, for a future um, session and fill us in on some of the thinking you've done, how it's evolved uh, since since now, um, that will be wonderful. Uh, so we also have um, Carlos Bustamante. No, just uh, one, um... The pedestrian comment, one of the reasons that, that, that you know, tying this back to Mark's comment about ancient DNA, I wonder how much of this has to do with, with David having chosen Caritiana as opposed to Sarui to do the one genome that got sequenced. I mean, it, it's a little bit of, um, uh, it, it, you know, um, historical contingency as it were. Um, uh, I think the, 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 the deeper comment that I wanted to raise is that, um, as we look out over the next decade or two, um, there's going to be a ton of data that's obviously going to come from the healthcare system as, as folks of all kinds of um, ancestry, including Caritiana, um, go about getting healthcare. So could you tell us a little bit about what the current um, sort of medical genetics looks like in, 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 in the country, particularly in indigenous populations? And as you start thinking about, say, universal basic childhood screening for Mendelian disorders that I'm pretty sure will become kind of like COVID testing, right? Everyone's getting COVID tested. It wouldn't shock me if in a couple of years it becomes pretty routine no matter where a child's born that they're being screened for Mendelian disorders and on and on and on. So, uh, I, you know, so, so, so if, if it's coming from researchers, it's one thing. If it's coming from the healthcare system, it's a little bit of a different thing. And, and, and in some sense, one of the ways that we think about this problem is in um, rubber meets the road quality of variant interpretation, where this is, is pretty going to happen, right? So ACMG 59 on people self-identify as Caritiana, something we're interested in interpreting uh, outside of every, everything else that's happened in the history of how HDDP and other things got, got to be. Could you tell us a little bit about how you see those data sets emerging in the context of clinical care? that might bridge into the, the last part of the discussion of, of relevance to um, ClinGen and other efforts. I, uh, Carlos, thanks for the, um, the question. Uh, it's very relevant. Uh, I have some context uh, about that uh, as it concerns Colombia, where I was born and where I did my uh, uh, PhD dissertation. Um, it, it's 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 happening. Uh, uh, large scale screening uh, processes are taking place in uh, countries like Colombia. There are uh, collaborations at the Latin American level, and um, these conundrums that we uh, ran into when exploring stories like the Caritiana and how um, their digital. Uh, 
sequences travel uh, among uh, different lab research laboratories do have a play in uh, the relationship between uh, what are we representing and what are we sampling and uh, how what what's the agency that uh, individual citizens have in um, offering input about such categories. Uh, for example, uh, while I was doing field work in, in Colombia uh, and I was following uh, researchers working in Bogota uh, at a Jesuit university, uh, the issue uh, emerged in terms of, you know, what happens with ethnic categories like uh, indigenous or Afro-Colombian, Afro-descendant, uh, in projects that look at um, breast cancer, for example. And um, the, the discussion was very uh, productive in the sense that um, uh, researchers were open to think about these issues because, you know, they, they know they matter, but their argument about, you know, keeping track of whether this indigenous person is from the Amazon or from the Pacific region in Colombia, ended up kind of like being useless in the context of how they were building database vis-a-vis -vis the argument of, you know, like, well, but we're dealing with the universality of cancer, right? So it it's at that point where, um, you know, like um, they were not being super detailed about the specific um, uh, regions where they were taking samples for these studies. As I was following their data sets and how they were uh, producing um, exchanges with uh, other colleagues in other countries in Latin America or in England, it, it was interesting for me to think about the challenges of metadata because, so they had all these samples uh, labeled uh, coming from Afro-Colombians or uh, indigenous people, but as soon as they were moved in a database uh, in, to England, all those that that specificity was dropped and then the label of South Americans became more prominent as the data set was used over there. So what we need to start, you know, like uh, addressing more urgently is like this play between uh, metadata um, and um, data and, and how that uh, creates, and, and this is not new for any of you, it's just like uh, I've been arriving to that problem from different angles. So the, the, the piece of research that we are uh, sharing with you uh, today, it's, it's just a, um, an entry point to uh, a larger uh, phenomenon that uh, I care about along with Jim, that it's about the resituation of um, scientific objects, not only per the objects themselves, but because of what uh, happens in the process. So it's not about the production and consumption uh, of uh, scientific knowledge, in this case, uh, genomic knowledge, but it's about what happens in the process to these different uh, pieces of uh, data, scientific uh, data, as they move uh, or are being reused by different uh, researchers in different places. So I. I I agree that the, the aspect of uh, data and metadata matters a lot when uh, we are um, considering uh, ethnic minorities and how they are uh, part of this larger uh, database that bases that are circulated in you know, unexpected ways um, today. Well, we are at time, and uh, so we have to end, but I really appreciate uh, your time, Dr. Bargan. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you to everyone who joined the forum today, asked questions, um, and uh, we I'm going to invite you back when you Jim, finish your paper, and we can have um, maybe more, even more structured debate and, and questions um, about some of the specific topics that came up, so I'm really curious to see how that, how that turns out. And do you have any Last, uh, just final take home messages since we'll be recording this and posting it. Uh, I, I just I just wanna say thank you, Alice, for this and bring a hand to create a, a bridge uh, to make this possible. I'm super grateful for to all of you for being here and offered, you know, uh, such wonderful insight. I've been taking notes and I'll 
I'll I'll do my best to you know uh, produce a, a robust article that you know will address some of the uh, issues that you mentioned. Um, for the Colombian tribes, if you want to know who got them, ask Andres Ruiz Linares okay. in England. Yes, thank you, Mark. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.